west of London, a group of people occupied a piece of derelict land in an effort to highlight the pressing global issues of land rights and a lack of sustainability within our modern societies. This film is about my experience of living in the community at Kewbridge Eco Village and how it became a springboard for activism which culminated in the Democracy Village on Parliament Square. The 6th of June 2009, our story begins in an empty field in West London. Welcome to the new Eco Village site. There's a section six on the door, so it's legally squatted. Um, hey! The whole desire is to create an Eco Village community here um, in the heart of this urban environment so that we can try and uh, promote and project uh, a new way of, of living. The first meeting was interrupted by the arrival of the police and everybody rushed to the front gate. There'll be no amplified music um, and no vehicles. We got people giving yeah. out leaflets to the community to tell them... Can we can. Yeah, just can we get a leaflet? Eco -village yeah. Leaflet! <laughs> As this was a civil matter, between the occupiers and the owners of the land, the police eventually left. Words cannot do justice to the power of people when they are free to work together without the constraints that are placed on them by the conventional society. We need to make people understand that the true issue in this world that is truly preventing our evolution is not the fact that we don't want to live ecologically, it's the fact that we don't have the freedom to do that. When the creative energy flows, there's nothing that is beyond possibility. Setting up an eco-village in London was an ambitious idea, and I wondered how long the landowner would allow it to exist, what its relationship with the city would be, and with the stated aim of using little or no money, how it would sustain itself. We'll see how the uh, olive oil works out, because literally we oh. just squeezed some olives, and we just uh, got some mixed it with water and just poured it in, mixed it with a bit of lemon, we're just going to put a bit of salt in it and then that's going to really bring out the flavour. Where did all the ingredients come from? From the bins! The leftovers of the capitalist society. This process of skipping would happen every night, and at its peak the village would feed up to 30 people a day, almost entirely on food taken from supermarket bins. Mark Spencer throws about a third of its food away every single day, and then the people that buy the food on average chuck about a third of their food away. Because we don't grow our own food and we've lost the value of what food is and how we come to get it, because you're so disconnected from its initial production. Um, we just have a tendency to be very careless with it. A 
I've moved into the eco camp basically because I think that in order to make a documentary about it, it's important to actually live here and understand what life, daily life is like. All these things that we've lost touch with, like those basic elements of living, like just basic survival. Yeah, so I'm trying to document that and also trying to contribute to the community at the same time. What's been the situation with water recently? Okay, we've been really lucky because just up the road there's a jet garage and um, they're letting us just like fill up every day. Do 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 do. It's a bit ironic, really, like having an eco village and getting our water from the jet garage. Yeah. It's not really sustainable. <laughs> People say it's an escape coming to a place like this, when actually what you're doing is facing the issues head on, taking action to live differently, and to benefit the whole community surrounding us, teach people new things, plant seeds, even in the minds of the developers. Like, okay, you want to develop this place, but there is another way to develop a bit of land. Changing the way that we look at things and our relationship with the land. collecting river water so we can water the plants and boil water for showers and stuff. And it's just around there, so it's really easy. <laughs> no one makes you do anything, so you've really got to do it yourself. It's not like being at school or university where you've got deadlines and you've got to do this essay by then and it makes you do it. It's like there's this one road that everyone seems to be pushed towards to go to uni, get a job, but that's just one pathway. And there's this thing called life and there's so many different ways of doing it. This is our uh, stinging nettle. We're going to strip the, the leaves, which you can do like that. The fibre in these stems we can use for making um, rope that is very decent, strong rope. The root of the nettle plant is a, a yellow dye. It's also a cure or a treatment for prostate cancer. There's this old saying, grasp the nettle by the sting. And why that is, is, is that when you grab a nettle firmly, you don't get stung. Because the needles on the nettle are very small. They're like tiny hypodermic syringes. And when you grab it strongly, you crush them. When you, when you brush past them, they have a chance to um, Sting you. BBC London came here on Wednesday and um, there was one guy initially with a camera he took a look around, liked what he saw and then asked if we'd mind if a journalist came down for the lunchtime news and they did a live broadcast with Kat uh, which, which you're just about to watch. It's one of the greenest parts of London with Kew Gardens, the river and now this. This is where we're going to be growing vegetables, so we can actually eventually source our own food. It's a site owned by developers, occupied at the weekend. The developers say they've applied for planning permission to build 150 homes and business space, and they're now considering what action to take. Up to 30 squatters have taken over the site, which has been unoccupied for about 20 years, although there are plans to turn it into flats. To be honest with you, it doesn't mean a lot to me. Uh, this media coverage. Um, I'm much more concerned about what the people on the other side of the road think exactly. than what the Times is saying. Tim Moore, I live uh, over there in the background, about 100 yards away, something like that. Yeah. Well, I'm just really pleased that it's been put to use. It's been sitting here for at least, I don't know, 10, 12 years, just um, growing weeds the size of trees and, uh, you know, what a, what a shame, what a terrible waste of space. My name's Laurie and I've lived in Brentford now for 12 years, just lived down on the council estate down there and we were um, instrumental in getting petitions to stop them from building the high-rise on this land. We live over there. We've been objecting to them building here for years. And now they want to put, like, 15 storeys, cutting out the river and the view. They're just going to do it anyway. If you weren't here, then these flats would be put up, definitely. They'd be higher than they said, like they did in Brentford. And it's wrong. We don't want this place here.
the village had gained a foothold on the land, and it seemed unlikely that the developer, St George, would go through the process of a costly eviction before they got their planning permission. So I decided to explore some more of the social dynamics within the group. Yeah, Kat's my girlfriend. Before we came here, we were together for about a year and three or four months. But coming here was quite hard at first. Um, because it's communal living in every single respect. You lose the opportunity to have private conversations and you're just occupied with other people and that's quite that was quite testing at first but um, everything's pretty good yeah it's like a movie in fact I feel my life is like a movie and one day I joke that someone will make Cat and Gareth the movie because everything we're going through we're sharing and it's just really interesting and I want as many people especially couples to experience this as well. My name is Becky and um, yeah, I'm living in Eco Village. This sort of strange little reality that we've created um, collectively out there, or concrete and all these horrendous things that ruin nature, it just it really conflicts with my heart and I've found myself here because it's natural for me to be here. They really like the bed here. That's amazing. <laughs> Due to the open door policy and its location in the city, the village was attracting people who for one reason or another had found themselves on the edges of society. When I was three years old, all I wanted to do was chase butterflies. And it felt like somebody picked me up by the back of the britches and said, no, you're not going to chase butterflies, and threw me into this forest of thorns called life. And I dwelled in that forest for many years, a forest of pain. When I hated myself, that's all I had to give people. I didn't realise that at the time. I gave people what I had inside. I had nothing good inside, so I had nothing good to give. Today, all I have is love inside. That's all I have to give. And today, and I have done for six years, I will every day for the rest of my life chase butterflies again. We should basically look out for new, any species of plant which you can see uh, that you don't recognise. And then we'll try and establish uh, what it is in the book and then see if it's edible. Whilst we're at the Eco Village, I think we should dedicate a good percentage of our time towards learning about nature and how to live in nature because that basically gives you the power to live freely. It's autonomy. My whole lifetime, I've been mostly separated from nature in terms of my learning. I've been learning about lots of other things that don't relate to nature. We have built the deluxe shower. The uh, bucket on a string has outweighed its uses. We've got full water catchment possibilities. We need to build some stairs going up so you can easily fill the hopper with beautiful steaming hot water. The water will come out of an actual shower head. So far we've built a lot of our structures using timber and recycled things. It's good to recycle and reuse what's in the city, but ultimately everything that we're reusing has come from very unsustainable practices, like the petrochemical industries and deforestation. So we need to start looking at things that we can live off in the future. Coppiced hazel or coppice willow doesn't involve chopping down whole trees. What we're suggesting is to make um, benders out of them. Most of the dwellings at the village were created from a mix of sustainable materials and recycled rubbish from the city. These structures are called benders 
and are made from the branches of hazel trees. Oh, my new home! And now um, this guy is being very generous and helping me sew it all together. But this is so empowering, you know, you're taking it into your own hands and you're actually doing something. Because everyone's got the same vision mm. and the same goal, yeah. so it's easy to cooperate and come together and work as a team yeah. to achieve, you know, that end result. The community was morphing from an eco-village into a sort of social centre and it was housing increasing numbers of people who simply had nowhere else to go. I came here um, three weeks ago um, because I'd lost my job and uh, I, I had nowhere to live, I had no money and I, I, I was living in a bivouac on the, on the river. Uh, in a sleeping bag. I, I was very miserable. I, I found the camp here, the eco village, and came in to have a chat to um, to the guys here. And I was very impressed with what they were doing here. And um, a guy named Simon, he, he said, "Why don't you just stay here for a while and uh, you know feel at home and feel the power of the earth and energy that uh, working together with people can create." You have to just walk down the street outside here, outside the village, and you'll see lots of people living on the street. Some are in a very bad way. Um, perhaps having had good jobs and just found themselves in a position with no family to go to, um, to look after them or to stay with, and um, finding it very difficult to get by. Ooh. So there I am, a nice sunny summer's day. I'm there, you know, with my wife and my oldest daughter. And I hadn't been out for a drink for a long time, you know, and I thought, yeah. I thought it'd be nice going to town today with a few beers, you know. I says, can you get us £30 pound at the bank? And, and she says, no. I said, what do you mean, no? She says, all you want to do is go out and piss it up. So what I did, I just picked up the video, yeah, <laughs> and sold it to my next door neighbour for £30. Pound. <laughs> and then I goes into town. Has a wonderful time. And, like, I comes back, you know, it's dark, evening time, it's dark. And, like, I've gone in, and straight away, I noticed that every single electrical item is gone. All my daughter's sort of, like, best expensive toys are gone. Like, I'm going to sell my daughter's toys. You know what I mean? So, with that, I mean, I've been out drinking, you know. I just fucking lost it. I went to my shed. I got my axe, right? <laughs> and I came in, and I demolished the fucking living room demolished it, fucking ripped it out, man, gutted it. <laughs> Everything in it just chopped to smithereens. We had two beautiful wall units. They, they were firewood, dude. <laughs> the first time I went to start a catch a gospel, I'm like, you don't know what to expect. I loved it. I mean, you've got patients who have been in the hospital for fucking God knows how long. They don't know how long. And like, I've got just shitloads of money, DLA, that's just accumulating and accumulating and nowhere to spend it. And, the, you know, they're depressed. I said, come out with me, dude. Let's go to the pub. You know what I mean? And it, I, I was like Jack Nichols in One for Love the Cuckoo's Nest that would take them all out. <laughs> <laughs> Hospital? Hotel, dude. <laughs> If I want your opinion, I'll fucking ask for it. Now, if you've got something to say for me, right, say it, I yeah? Until then, shut the fuck Alan, up, man. Right? right? I'm not queuing to the middle of next one. Alan, shut the please, fuck man, up. Please. Don't talk to me like my dickhead, yeah? I'm not yeah, talking to you like a... Who is? Yeah? Alan, you know no, what? Alan, Alan, Alan. Alan. What? Alan. You're not going to do that, man. You're not going to do that, man. Alan. Fuck off. Come on. Let's just get one thing straight, go, right? man. Don't take me for a cunt, because I'm don't, okay man. me, yeah? Once every two weeks, Alan gets some money, and um, he's he went out drinking, and he's been doing that all day. I find myself questioning, like, what am I doing, and why am I here? Is this insane that I've, I've just moved into an eco village? I've been turning down all my life of work, I've given up my flat. 
literally just live here. The other had Matt insane toothache. And I had, can you see that? I had two teeth out, I had two teeth out the other day, look at that. Amazing one. Ooh, How are you feeling yeah. this morning, Nia? I'm feeling very rejuvenated, refreshed, ready for anything. I'm so like in a positive frame of mind right now. Yeah? What yeah. happened with your bender? Yeah, um, <laughs> it burnt down on Friday. Um, I left the candle on and I went to the shops. I forgot about it. And it was just like black smoke, like I couldn't breathe. And then it just went boom. Set, set up, straight up in flames. Could you maybe lay it out in terms of where we're at with the drink and all that? Um, some people drink um, excessively and then they're not able to control their behaviour. And then there's more people that are attracted to this site. They think it's like where they can just drink or do drugs and stuff and nothing gets, like, no one says anything about it. So they come as well and then it's just like, you know, a bit out of control after a while. So, and that can affect the whole, like, dynamics and the whole atmosphere as well. And it just brings the whole mood down. Then, David Shaler arrived. David is a former MI5 officer turned whistleblower, who gained a mini celebrity status in the 1990s when he was jailed for passing secret information to a national newspaper about an MI6 plot to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi in Libya. Well, I went through a conventional spiritual awakening, I went through another one after that in 2007, basically. Mine, my, mine was 04, and it came in two parts. The first part, there I was in prison, I woke up one morning, and I loved everybody. I mean, everybody. I mean, in prison, I never felt free in my life. I was totally free, and I've been happy ever since. And then the second part was like the job I was given to do, and it scared me to death. And it felt like I was being solely asked to save the world, and I was not up for it. No, not me, leave me alone. And the spirit guides were on my case, they would not let up yeah, for no, four just, days. Same thing. At the end of four days, I found myself accepting with a glad heart, yeah. and I've been doing it ever since, man. No, I had the same since. thing, it's when, when God comes to you to start with, you just think this can't be right. This yeah, cannot yeah. Be right. I, and I was then, questioning my sanity and everything. Yeah, like yeah, that. no, you do. You start thinking, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? But then you get to a point where it just just, just it, it, you just know you know yeah. exactly what you've got to do yeah. and, that, and that to me is the best part of it because once you know in your life what the mission is you, you, you're clear you, you yeah. understand it you understand yeah. how you fit into everything and what you've got to do so uh, maybe we could just talk a bit about your uh, how you're feeling about the arrival of David Shaler uh, well, personally it's a very surreal experience on top of being here in the first place um, and all the things that are going on here, it's very strange. On Channel 4 News, they interviewed him, he said that he was the Messiah and the last reincarnation of, of Jesus, I think it was. And um, he's, he's quite well known, he's quite a celebrity. I think he has the celebrity standing to possibly get into something like Celebrity Big Brother. And now he's come out as a transsexual called Dolores Kane as well. So it's, what's next? Can you tell me about the dream that you had last night? Well, I woke up at three in the morning covered in sweat after a, a nightmare in which David had changed into his Dolores Kane persona and was trying to stab me with a knife. And it was really terrifying. I've pissed off a lot of people, MI5, MI6, the CIA, the FBI, Mossad, the Zionist New World Order, all those kind of things. So it, you, you kind of take your pick who's actually going to try and kill me out of those people. But nevertheless, I can assure you, I've been in four serious car accidents, which I walked out of without a scratch. I've been subjected to meningitis, pneumonia, food poisonings, all sorts of things, basically, and I've lived through it. Uh, I know I'm Jesus Christ. The village was a very transient place. Many people would come and go. Sometimes people I was filming would simply disappear. Like Alan, who went out drinking with Yeon one night and never came back. My heart is broken. Yeah, the lovely Catherine and I 
I'll no longer. I find myself in this really difficult situation, really, because she's here and I'm here, she doesn't want to leave, I don't want to leave, and I don't want her to leave because this is really something that she's been working towards for a long time. I still love her. And she's here all the time. So my whole existence is a very torturous one at the moment, compared to, say, five weeks ago when I was the happiest guy on the planet. You know, it may ruin your credibility hey, by dressing up like a woman and then I'm on saying a Jesus. The Messiah will be a transvestite. It's the biggest joke in history. But partly a serious test. If you're bothered by a tranny and not bothered by people having white phosphorus dropped on them in Gaza, you've got a problem. Gareth, come on. Here's the thing, Shayla, ha he's a clever guy. He has all these intellectual points. He's obviously become a bit messed up, maybe due to spending time in uh, Belmarsh, due to the Official Secrets Act violation. I don't know, but he can't be expected to be taken seriously if he dresses up like a transvestite, says he's Jesus, understand? It doesn't really make sense. I mean, I don't want to say it's deliberate or anything, but whenever he goes to a project, the media kind of see it as his project and then because of all the crazy stuff he's done and is doing, it kind of sheds a bad light on the project that he's come to. So even on this eco-village, we are perhaps running a risk of this becoming Shayla's Dolores Messiah project, we are all his disciples or I don't know, and it could really backfire. Perhaps I was a bit guilty of this myself. Focusing my lens on the more eccentric aspects of village life was sometimes irresistible, and I decided that I should focus a bit more on the rest of the community. I keep telling people about it. fossil fuels. Fossil fuels were made in the past, yeah? They're a product of the life in the past that generated the health and vitality of the atmosphere. We dig them up in the present and recombine them with the atmosphere, thus taking away its health and vitality. By digging up the past and burning it in the present, we are burning the future, big time. When I first retired, I didn't know whether I was going to re retire full-time or just retire a bit. And I thought if I could find an ethical job, then I could do a job and support myself that way. And I became more and more aware of the fact that there isn't such a thing as an ethical job. Everything that we do is at the cost of our natural environment. And as such, we're destroying our own future for a short-term financial profit. And this makes me incredibly uncomfortable, so I chose not to do it. For a long time I haven't done anything that's viable, anything that supports life. 
but a couple of years ago I got involved in a sandwich round, which is going around to food shops that at the end of the day would throw away their sandwiches if there wasn't somebody reputable to collect yeah. them. So for me to be able to do something that stops that life from being thrown away and get it to people that appreciate it, that need it, is actually the closest I've ever found to an ethical job. Although it's not a job, I do it for fun. Each evening, friend would collect unsold sandwiches from four different sandwich shops and hand them out to the homeless. He would make this 16 mile round trip in and out of central London every night of the week without fail. chicken. Before we headed back to the village, we had one more stop to make, to build a massive wooden box with veteran anti-war protester Maria Galastegui at Parliament Square. It's all reclaimed wood and it's all from the eco-village. And it's not something that they're going to like. Obviously, this is Westminster, this is uh, Parliament Square. This is, in, in effect, a sort of um, Piccadilly Circus, but politically. Why should we be told we've got an enemy anywhere? I've never been to Afghanistan, I've never been to Iraq, I've not been to Iran. Why should we be told, because for political reasons or business reasons, they tell us that these people are our enemy? It is a madness. So we've actually got to empower ourselves and actually say, no, I disagree, I won't be a part of it. We've got to use our space in order to get out a political message. It was becoming clear that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had been a catalyst for many of the people who had ended up at the eco-village. And Maria and Parliament Square would later become much more important to the story. But for now, it was time to cycle back to Kew. So it's 11 days until the planning meeting. I think if we set an absolute deadline for production of leaflets... Yeah, that's a sensible idea. This is very interesting. The proposed development would rise from two storeys near the river front up to seven, eight and nine storeys in part at Kewbridge Road front. So it's going to be vastly bigger than they've described. And this has been derelict for so many years and there have been so many complaints about, you know, the plans that have been put forward by the developers, that, which kind of gives you more hope, doesn't it, in some ways, that you can, you, it would be possible to stop them from building such a monstrosity on land like this, even though they've lucked into having their planning meeting pulled forward by a month or so. What have we got here, Mr Shaler? It's a kind of Moroccan couscous thing, really, and uh, a sort of Chinese thing as well. What I do is I work with things and work them up and work them up for the right flavour, basically. I'm just having some flax seeds now, just to add a bit of omega-3, 6 and 9, a bit of protein to the dish. The talent of cooking is to keep tasting the food. You can't do it by following the recipe. When people say to me, what's your recipes, and I try to write them down for them, they never work, basically, because they don't so really... You just, you just go with the flow? Yeah, it's all about tasting. You, you, you get to know ingredients, obviously, what you can do with them, but at the same time, you also taste and taste and taste to check that you're doing the right thing with them. As the weather was getting colder and the winter was closing in, we were all spending much more time crammed together in communal spaces. Michael, somebody who had requested not to be filmed, had allegedly been stealing meat from the kitchen. Michael nicking all the fucking food to cook his own meals up in his tent. When... Has he been doing that? Yeah, he's yeah. been doing it for ages. We were ages. supposed to have a meat stew we last night. Eat with and he fucking nicked all the meat and went to cook a meal in his own tent for himself. It might be better to just, rather than name individuals, just say, talk about. Well, because then it's just going to say, madness. Name and shame. Name and shame. Yeah. We take responsibility. No, it's not beat around the fucking bush. But then, yeah, exactly. this is me, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah, I know, but he'll get, he'll get <laughs> a bit upset, and then everyone else will get a bit upset, and then it'll just explode, and then it'll go on for days. Apparently, Michael won't eat food cooked by males or women while they're menstruating. That's all right, that's fine, that's how he feels. What religion is he Cunt. I think if everybody sticks together and um, makes it work, 
it, it, it will work. If people don't stick together and work together, it's not going to work. And that's how I feel. I felt like I've uh, gained a family living here with all the people. We've uh, spent so much time together, spent so many experiences together, built a whole community together. And we've been brought together out of a joint need for a better world, joint intention to do the right thing. They've just mown down, they haven't even done anything yet. There's been a structural engineering, uh, a couple of guys who came by a couple of weeks ago and said that they had to take down the fence because it was um, unsafe like, for health and safety. They've come back three weeks later with a, with like a digger. It looks like they're doing it with much less care than they could do. They just don't want diggers on the land looking like they're tearing the place apart because it just gives an impression that St George are already in here. After a long, intense discussion with St George, we finally allowed them to continue their work on the fence. And to be honest, it felt like an invasion into what I now considered my home. British Broadcasting Corporation are coming here um, to film us for the Inside Out program, which goes out at 7.30 on a Monday just before EastEnders, and that's a nationwide TV show. And they're going to be filming us for about eight minutes, which is quite exciting because about six million people are going to be able to find out about this place. For me, I would rather have, like, 5,000 local people come in and check this place out than 5 million TV viewers in a way. Because the connection that you make with 5,000 people who actually come in is far stronger than anything that you can generate across the TV screen, in my opinion. But hopefully, maybe some of those viewers will come in and then they'll build that connection. For ourselves, um, using sort of locally available materials. Right, so... No, Paul, you've got a pain. Okay. Um, all houses that we built ourselves out of the locally available materials. Hello? Hold on, stop there. <laughs> Just a couple of minutes before, they said they didn't want us talking about the war, um, or war, um, because it would take their segment off in a different direction that they weren't comfortable with. So what do they want their section to be about? They want wholly about sustainability. Um, but I, I'm comfortable talking about that, but it just seemed a shame that I wasn't allowed to talk about why I was here. It was Christmas morning, and the first thing I did was go to see how Jesus was feeling on his birthday. I'm very happy, yeah. No, 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 to God, I couldn't be happy in some ways. I really couldn't be. I mean, you know, next year I do keep pointing out to the Zionists, I don't think they quite understood this year that it's not me running out of time, it's them running out of time. <laughs> yeah, it's all going my way at the moment. All I've got to do is, is, is stay in the position I am. 
uh, everything's going wrong for them. They don't think it like that. They think I've got to lead a mission and got to lead humanity in 2012 and so on, but that's not the mission at all. Christmas, Louis! <laughs> Merry Christmas, Shane. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Been living here for a long time now. I wasn't sure when, when I first walked through the gate if we'd be here for six months. It's quite interesting to be here on Christmas Day rather than with my family. It's a good day to just sort of sit and hang out with people. I like the fact with Christmas is a mass intention to get together with the people you care about and the people you have a duty to. In fact, you might not dig your parents, but no one else digs them either. You better look after them. <laughs> Christmas is cool. I'm having a good time. Just go outside. Mm. It's like beautiful. It's only snow. There's nothing special about it. People get all worked up. It's just snow. It's just uh, rain that's turned to ice. You got me? <laughs> My name is Choco. Poco Loco. I come from Peru. And how long have you been hanging out in the Eco Village? Five months now. And I slept with Jesus last night, so I'm famous now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was very nice and warm, and he transported me to paradise. What was Dave Shayla like as a lover? Oh, very good, very nice. Fantastic. <laughs> Eco Warriors Brave Big Freeze as Q Site Village continues. It was a sunny summer's day when a group of 30 eco-warriors set up camp on the disused field next to Kew Bridge. Six months later, the residents of the impromptu sustainable community are still living on the former Scottish Widow site in Kew Bridge Road, Brentford. Despite the looming threat of a nine-storey block of flats being built there by developer and site owner St George, the sub-zero temperatures brought by the Big Freeze, one of the lengthiest cold spells to hit the capital in more than a decade, have also failed to deter the eco-villages from leaving their wooden structures, herb gardens and compost toilets and shower. Seven months. Yeah. Reflections. Oh. Well. I don't know if I can do this right now, Dean. My Christmas was beautiful. Um, I was back with my uh, my family in, in Wales. Um, my sister and my brother and uh, my dad and his partner and um, they got engaged. My dad and his partner on Christmas Day. And then on Boxing Day, my dad went into hospital, and he died a week ago today. So it's a, you know, it's a difficult period. Um, you, you know, you, you appreciate what's important to you, and um, it's a time of reflection and contemplation. And of course, I'm so sad that my dad's passed, but that is the nature of existence, and that's something that we have to accept, really. It was Valentine's Day, and the winter was turning to spring. For over 10,000 years, human beings have been saving and storing seed, seeds, 
some of which they eat and some of which they sow to create their next crop. Because of the commercialization and industrialization of food, we're seeing as a direct result fewer, fewer varieties of seeds being produced on market. And so the purpose of the CD Sunday is for people to bring in seed varieties which you might not be able to buy in the shops, which they're growing on their allotments, and they can swap those varieties, and we can keep those varieties in circulation. So we're the guardians of biodiversity. We're the ones that have got to ensure that it doesn't collapse. But this is actually really good soil. There's worms in there, it's living, it's like, it's rich, it's loamy, it's not very clayey. When you squeeze it together, it doesn't stick together too much. So that's a really good soil right there. Realistically, how much of our own food could we be growing and living on here in a space like this? Exponential, there is no limit to what we can grow in here. St George had got their planning permission and local councillor Andrew Dakers came by to deliver a message. Just a bit of background, there's only there's only one person from St George, a guy called Malcolm Woods, who's their, their land director. Um, they've suggested that as a ward councillor I facilitate the meeting and just bring bring the, the two parties in the sense to, to, together. Um, my I think in terms of where St George are at, they, they want to use the, the meeting to share information on where they're at and what sort of time scale they're looking at between now and, um, and building on, on the site. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a way to shut up the party. Yeah, yeah we were having such a lovely time talking about plants and stuff. Basically, the long and short of it is that the people at St George feel that they have to go down the legal avenue, court proceedings, because they can't be entirely sure that we will all leave voluntarily. And the time frame for that was basically May. Can I just can I just make it, make it clear for myself? Cat. So it's clear in my head. What I've just heard out there is we've got six weeks. What is that what they said? We've got six weeks to move yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but um, if, if, if um, people think like I do, uh, I'm going to stay here as long as I can. Um, how long is the court proceedings going to take? Uh, week. They're starting next week. So would we be forcibly evicted? Yeah, yes. Uh, yes. Tuesday, court on the Tuesday, we could be out on no. Thursday. Yeah, six so lands, two days. Three so days. You get, so you get bailiffs coming in and forcibly evicting yeah. people. I reckon we can like uh, probably resist them if we have enough people. I think that's the thing, like getting enough people here on, on the day when they come to kick us out. I reckon we've got a good chance, personally. 30 of us, 200 of them. Uh, well, how, how are they going to know how many to send if they don't know how many of us there are? There's, there's 30 of us who live here, but there's 200 people who like this place, at least. <laughs> We've received a notice of hearing and we are expected to appear in Brentford County Court. What's your feelings about this? Just to take every day as it comes, not to make any plans. Just keep talking to people, find out what they want to do. and Because you've got the, the Freeman crew that are going to be all over this, telling people what we should be doing. It's going to be really weird when we have to leave this place, really weird, but I'm not really thinking about that at the moment. Um, yeah, I couldn't help but feel a little bit sad because I've, I, I guess I have grown attached to this place even though like I, I didn't intend to because it's just been such an incredible experience, like absolutely beautiful and you sort of like forget that you're not going to be here forever because you're just living in the moment. As if by magic, the summer had come back around again, and the seeds this community had planted were in full bloom. With the threat of eviction looming over it, Kew Bridge was at the forefront of a mini resurgence in land rights activism, with eco villages popping up all over the place.
There was lots going on, and it was unclear where the film would focus next. But on the 1st of May, a group set out from the village and marched eight miles into the centre of London to protest the war in Afghanistan. If your government goes to war and you stand back and watch, and then turn around and say, oh, it's all Tony Blair's fault, or it's all Gordon Brown's fault, to me, that's uh, denial. You're deferring responsibility onto a small group of people who couldn't have done what they did without your expressed consent in the form of your inaction. And so we've got to be brave, basically. And we've got to throw caution to the wind. And we've just got to march in solidarity and just go for it if we really want peace. Um, after May Day, um, a few people set up tents and Maria organised a democracy village, which is now, there's still people going there now and more, more tents are turning up. Simon and Anita have been there since we left. They've built like a kitchen there and Simon's just come back and he's like, that's his main thing at the moment. He's now going to be in Parliament Square. He's saying he wants to stay there until the troops are pulled out of Afghanistan. Oh, hello. <laughs> We've had enough. The peace movement, what is it? Where is it going? You know, what are we achieving? If we build this camp up, we need to build it up to a bursting point where it bursts out over the square and the people are here and to, we want a message to go out right around the world that the British people we don't support them all. We don't want our troops there. We don't need more people being killed. The Democracy Village had set up camp during a general election, and on the 12th of May 2010, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats joined to form a coalition government. Neither party had in its election manifesto any plans to withdraw British troops from Afghanistan. I tell you, about to do a live feed. Why are none of the major parties talking about pulling out of Afghanistan? Even though the British people want out of Afghanistan. The people of this country want peace. They don't want war. They want an end to war. They are sensing that power. Now, having said that, they do know that this is going to be a very difficult thing to get to work, this coalition. They know that many of us are not natural allies of the Liberal Democrats. It is a strange marriage. I sense tonight there is a real determination to make that marriage work. Right outside uh, Downing Street, there's a tree, basically. Uh, quite a nice big tree. And uh, it's very easy to climb, as far as I can see. Ladder against the tree, two people in the tree, drop the banners. Even Mr Cameron himself will be aware that it's day one of his administration, there are people asking for the boys to be brought back. Meanwhile, back at Kew, the court proceedings were going ahead and a small number of people wanted to fight the case with a legal theory called Freemanism. They believed that the law was an illusion and it didn't really exist and that they alone could prevent the eviction. I, Dominic, as commonly called of the Lohan family, will say as follows. Equality before the law is paramount and mandatory. I am a man, not a person unknown. So let me make myself known to you. I, Dominic, as commonly called of the Lohan family, am a man with a soul, not a person as legally defined. A person is a corporate legal fiction. Basically, where we're on the land and we are real beings, and the persons are defined as fiction, the property is defined as fiction, you know what I mean? And the, the judge is fiction, the, the whole court's fiction. How can it operate in truth? It was all a bit confusing, but the free man approach meant confronting the judge at the beginning of the court case, which may have prevented others from putting their points across. This was causing division in the village. What is your actual problem with the Freeman approach to this court case? People might say, yeah, it works, it works, blah, 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 but, I mean, it's never really worked. I've, I've never seen anyone actually show me an example of where it's worked. As a civil matter, the bloke can judge in our absence, so it doesn't... it makes no se sense to right, make a run out of the court. But you can appeal to his humanity and try and get some sort of... a decent length of time for us to relocate. Oh, God, I, have the, I, I Andy, of the Baker family, commonly known as... bullshit. <laughs> Have it in 
black and white, otherwise they won't listen to you. Yes, they That's will. That's how the system works. No, well, they'll listen they, to you, they, but they'll totally ignore you. Well, it's well, got to be filed. Yeah, well, so you're going to have a little meeting this morning? So, I don't think we need to. If, if you do speak and it's not filed, it's irrelevant. Obviously, you've got to have a group decision, and I don't want to upset people. So I'll just sit back and watch things flow yeah. and say at the end, told you so, because it's already served. This is not I'm a criminal saying. matter, this is a civil matter. If you know so much about the law, why do you not know this basic fact? Well, he's still got more his The judge ruled in favour of St George and gave us a week to leave the site. It's been interesting to see since all the legal documents and court papers have arrived. The process does have a very big impact on the community and the psyche of it. I feel that um, with Freeman stuff, I've, I've experienced people into free man stuff before. It seems to create a very evangelical viewpoint whereby it is, this is my belief and I want to convert everyone to this belief. And if you don't believe it, then you're, you're committing some sort of thought crime. After the court case, the free men were telling anybody that would listen that myself, Andy and Gareth were working for the police. Well, I've got to say, I did, you know, I just found it almost unfathomable when I got back. I, you know, I walked into my bender and sort of said jokingly, "Hi, who's in my bender?" And the response I more got was, "This is this is not your bender anymore." Who's that? Uh, this was uh, Mirthful and Dom. Mirthful's uh, been here for quite a while. Dom's a relatively recent arrival. They were then trying to tell me that um, you and, and Andy had um, deliberately lost the court case. That that there was, this was somehow evidence of the fact you were working for the other side and that uh, you, Dean, had actually done this, so you had a finale for your film about the eco-village. Now, I mean, I just haven't... I don't think I've ever heard anything quite so insane, basically, you know? But they were seriously putting that forward to me, and I was saying, it's just ridiculous, for God's sake, you know? Andy, how are you feeling? Yeah, all right. A lot of people in the village coming up to me going, what's this about Don Murphy saying you work for MI5? But, yeah, you don't really expect it from people you live with and just for disagreeing with their opinion. I mean, I disagree with Dave. I don't think he's Jesus, but we, st we can still sit here and chat and get on with each other and be mates. This sort of paranoid thinking wasn't confined to the eco-village. This bitch here, the sea devil, she had us arrested on the 13th of January this year. The sea devil here. Long-time peace campaigner Brian Hoare and Barbara Tucker, Maria's neighbours in Parliament Square, have been accusing her of working for the police for over a year. How does this kind of thing go on, Maria? This is regular, and I've been, accusations are made of me from that camp, which is totally unfounded. They actually believe it, and Brian believes it, and uh, their whole lives is consumed by it. They're not actually doing any campaigning or anything. They just speak morning, noon and night of, of um, us working with the police, and now the camp, she just said, we're working with David Cameron. I mean, how... How crazy is that? I have been subject to an awful lot of abuse, which a lot of people haven't witnessed because obviously no one's been here. Do you have any links with Brian? No, we don't. Uh, no. Yeah. They will definitely tell you they do not have anything to do with us. So it's, 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 so it's almost two separate factions then? Yes, it is, yes. Okay. Yeah. What we're doing here is an amazing thing and we're actually under an umbrella of some kind of strange rainbow magic because pretty much you're not allowed to do a lot of the things we're doing here, and we're just doing it.
the community felt fractured, with a lot of energy focused on the democracy village. And I couldn't help feeling that the eco-village was being neglected. I was torn between two places that had been bound together by the people I'd been filming for the last 12 months. I think it's very sad to leave the place. Because it's a nice community here. Have to be optimistic. Yes, love one another. Try to understand people and accept them the way they are. And look forward to the future. It's beautiful. Life is beautiful. Too much stress these days, isn't it? The peace camp in Westminster was attracting increasing numbers of homeless people. You know, it could be a lot worse, but it's not good, like you can see, I mean, people like Andrew. I mean, maybe he's a great guy, I'm not disputing that, but I'm here to campaign. And a lot of people here are here to campaign, so when all these people just come, just munching food, getting pissed, sleeping all over the place, putting visitors away from the site, it's not a good look, it's not productive. And if it's not productive, then why should we accommodate that, because at the end of the day this is a campaign, it's not a hostel. And there's loads of places in London these people can get help if they, if they want it, so I think that's a route that they should explore. This has been more safer for me than being where we have been. I feel safer because there's cameras everywhere. There's going to be in Westminster, isn't there? Absolutely disgusting. They throw you into a pack of wolves, into hostels, where there's lots of other drug addicts, drinkers and what have you not. And then they all fight with each other, basically. When you're on the streets, because you have to sleep with one eye open, it makes you more chilled out if you've got had a drink in you. I could give it up right now, not a problem. OK, we have some drinkers on the site and we have some drug users on the site, OK? But actually, we've got to realise that we're in Westminster, the borough of Westminster. Right, so it is, a, it is always going to be an ever-present issue. Unless we want to turn into a proper police state and any drunk that comes on it will just like, ow, off, and just, you know, really aggressive and, and make it a very unpleasant environment for them. Personally, I think that will reduce the vibration of this site and will actually become quite unpleasant through that experience. But at the moment, I think it's a, an acceptable limit. Personally, I do. The Queen was set to pass by the democracy village for the state opening of parliament. So the police came to search our tents for bombs. You crushed my damaged spine. You crushed. This is an extreme provocation. You tortured me for 40 minutes. You assaulted me last time, Sergeant. Will you get out of the way, please, Brian? I'm not in the way. Brian, you are in the way. I'm I want to search in my tent. home. If you don't, you will be arrested. I'm going. Right. Brian, you are, you're under you arrest. Are, no, I'm not under arrest. You do not understand arrest. anything, but it may I'm going defense. to open my you tent. Not you I'm not opening. Later on in court. Oh, for the reason goodness, why you're being sir. arrested. Get out of the way or you'll be arrested. She's not in the way. You are hurting him. You are hurting him. My back. You are hurting me. Gee, I can't imagine if it was to get rid of us. It's important to acknowledge that this film is a snapshot in time, and I met Brian Hoare after ten hard years on the pavement outside Parliament. These constant battles with the police seem to have taken their toll, and helped to create the division on the square. Royal Eyesore, protesters Gia Queen on way to Parliament. MPs brand peace camp a national disgrace. If they're attacking us, then we must be doing the right thing. So the more we get attacked, the better it is. Get rid of these scoundrels, they're really making a bloody nuisance.
During this action, Simon, Anita, Gareth and Luca were all arrested, which left just Jan and I to sprint back to Kew first thing in the morning. Yeah, they came in to evict us. Um, they, Josef has got on top of the platform and they've pulled his trousers down. They've pulled his trousers off him and they won't give him back. I'm willing to testify in court that they've raped him. They've pulled his trousers off him and have made him nude in, in, in public. These people have raped him, basically. Get his trousers back! You want to look after me? Then why are you allowing people to poison the air? I can't change that. Why not? Because I'm not in control of that part. Yes, of you are. I'm Every not. single person is. It's from his department. Yeah. It's all of our department life. It's not, I oh yeah, I can put it. the blame on somebody, I can look the other way. I don't get paid for it. You're an active it's part in it. Uh, you don't get uh, paid it's for it. I was talking to my mum the other day about um, about everything, about society, about capitalism, corporatism, and she was saying that she realised that we had a lot of problems that we needed to sort out, and that the way that everyone was living, what they were supporting by living the life that they did, uh, that it was obviously very wrong, and that something needed to be done about it. But at the same time, she felt like she couldn't do anything about it. She couldn't be the change that she wished she could see in the world. She didn't feel like she could enact any of that change for, on a larger scale for a, as many people as possible. And standing here watching this eco-village where we've all been living for so long get destroyed, I'm being able to feel how she feels about it all. Powerless in the face of all this destruction of the planet, of the people, of people's spirits. Just watching it all get destroyed, every bit of creation, every bit of creativity still come crashing down. Just because we want it to be something different. I'm really glad that Kew Bridge existed and I, when I went there the other day, I looked at Kew and I just thought, that is so great that we did that. And it is so great that the locals in Brentford saw that because that is gonna totally open their consciousness up. The fact that they, they saw a village basically destroyed. That is definitely sunk into the consciousness of the locals in Brentford. And I'm really glad about that as well, because it will force them, not force them, but it will encourage them to think a bit more about people's right to live, you know, people's right to live outside the system and how you get treated if you do live outside the framework. The mayor of London, Boris Johnson, was taking the democracy village to the High Court to try and have us removed from the square. Very quick circle, we're gonna visualize the court case being adjourned and us uh, being given more time to continue our peaceful discussion forum. We're going to do it very quickly and then we're on the move. Can't we just visualise us winning? Yes, visualise us winning. And peace. And peace. Visualise peace.
two of Brian and Barbara's tents, which were situated on the grass, had been dragged into the Democracy Village court case. This was unfortunate, as it only added to their suspicions that we were working for the police. Quite interesting in the High Court. We had an hour and a half to get statements from 15 defendants. It wasn't going to happen, so I got adjourned till Monday. Came out of the court, saw Seamus, Dean and Simon on the roof. So, pretty productive day. I'll get the police over. I'm going to no, go. No, no, and that will make me kill you. You'll be in a cell anyway. No, no. Can you just time. tell me what happened? She came at me. Our homeless population was growing by the day. Angel, a long-term heroin addict, was suffering from withdrawal symptoms. Yeah, but how much you had to drink? Give that tissue for me, please. He's going to get me some water, son. Absolutely. Yeah, sit up then, babe. <laughs> I know the feeling. That's it. All right. There you go. It's no wonder that we have got homeless people living with us on Parliament Square for the precise reason that they don't have adequate shelter to live. And maybe some of them don't even want to live indoors, but they're coming here because this is a sanctuary. And that is natural, isn't it? For people wanting to live, just to live in a place in the community. People are seeking community. I haven't had drugs for two days. Right now, there's more homeless people than there are activists. But I think it's great that they have somewhere to come, you know, because they're just, they're the product of the society which we're trying to change. So it's right that they should be here. They are humans too. You've got a bumblebee on your T-shirt, Dean, and I'm not winding you up. We love each other and I cannot tell you how it is. How, how can we describe this? I don't know. I love him. I he just feel me. as if I've been born to protect her. I mean, yeah. it might sound fucking stupid to most people. I've never had any feelings for any person or any woman in my fucking life. Put the side away, love. Why? It's all right, Tracy. It's on camera. With me. You've got to be yourself, haven't you? Yeah, so, what yeah, but we don't want to show the whole frigging world that we're drinking. Why not? Everybody else drinks. I'm not ashamed of it. He's ashamed of it. I am, to be honest with you, yeah. Why? I don't know why I am. As drugs and alcohol flooded the square, altercations were becoming increasingly bizarre. It's whatever you can, where you can. I'm here for the right reasons, Terry. You're ripping down signs, and I don't You're understand. Don't mean anything. anything. Fuck it, this is the question. Do you want the soldiers to be brought home? Yes or no? Alive. Alive. Yes? If that says bring our soldiers home, then why are you ripping it up? Rip my name! Angel. It's okay. Oi, that Fuck. Stupid Trollope. Trollope! Look at yourself. Yeah, when you go that. This is the single most challenging thing I've been involved in in my entire life. And uh, I kind of want it to go the wrong way in court so that we can stop having to deal with these drunk drug addicts and we can get on with what we came here to do which is raising awareness and trying to get the soldiers out of Afghanistan. That's all I want to do. I don't want to be a social worker. Many people were feeling like Gareth and almost all of the activists were leaving because violence was becoming a daily occurrence. Then you smashed the bird on the yeah, I can't just finish it off with that. With that air fault for picking a smash bottle up in it. You've got I got tomorrow. cut too, yeah? You've she got picked tomorrow. the bottle up. Air and got cut. Right. That's air fault. You've got in till it. tomorrow. It is! You don't, you won't lose that finger if you get that stitched. Well, they said I'm gonna lose that finger. Not if you go and get you it won't. stitched now. If you get that stitch, you, you could keep that finger.
So uh, I've just witnessed somebody being nearly stabbed with a broken bottle. Um, as you saw, the girl's hand there got sliced. And you've got people here on the ground actually having to deal with serious threats of violence. And uh, I think we need to really, truly fit. We've got to shut this place down, basically. It's, it's become horrible. The judge this morning ruled I'm granting the ev eviction and I'm granting the injunction. Both of those things are happening. Right now, you've got a bunch of very tired human beings who are drained, who've been coping with stress and anxiety, with aggression, constant lack of sleep, who want to knock it on the head on the basis that right now it has been in a very fragile state and, and there have been violence has been breaken out. The injunction's been served seemingly to the village and they're saying about four o'clock today it'll be illegal to be camping on the square, uh, you'll be breaking bylaws, but Feynman's lawyers uh, are still in an appeal at the moment, so it's uh, 25 past three. So, you know, think anything could happen, but at the moment it, it seems unlikely the bailiffs are going to be here for four o'clock. This whole eviction thing has created unnecessary attention on this site. We're being put under the microscope. For all the troubles and the madness, this is very powerful, man. We're right next to Parliament. The whole world is seeing it in the form of actual people from all over the world who are coming to see the great British Empire. And what they're finding is that all is not well in the state of Denmark and that people are actually standing up and speaking out. And so... In a flick of a switch, you could have a huge demonstration turn up here. Well, we're just going up to Downing Street to let the Prime Minister David Cameron know that we're asking for immediate end to the Afghan war. We're calling for an end to the illegal war. We're calling for an end to the illegal war in Afghanistan. War with the Soviet Union. Everyone sit down. Get out. There you go. Peace not war. Peace not war. Peace not war. been arrested quite a few times, you know, I don't mind. Because in history, that's what people have done in order to create change. Be very persistent and determined, keep coming back, keep being arrested, sent to prison, keep going, and then they start to be heard and listened to. You know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Good morning, Dean. How do you feel uh, this morning after hearing the news? That the appeal has been rejected. Terrible. But I think we should remain solid. Amen. Because everybody's been so friendly, very peaceful, very tidy. I'm very proud of everybody. There's been a couple of little divisions and a couple of few troublemakers, like anywhere else. Have you made a lot of friends here? Oh, friends for life. Well, I'm on film. Hello, I'm Angel again. This is going to be a match. I'm off to drugs nearly five days. And I want to say thank you to the guys. I oh, know I'm never going to see you again after this. All I can say is thank you. I had become fond of Angel, and with the democracy village drawing to an end, I realised a sad irony, that we had had a far greater chance of helping some of the dispossessed of London than we ever did of bringing the troops home from Afghanistan. 
Democracy Village, a ragtag community of peace activists, oh, look, pro democracy campaigners, and the homeless in central London is about to be torn down. The media is not here at the moment. Um, they're just kind of waiting to document our demise, sort of closure on the village. That's the end of the story. But we've got to preempt that. They are leading up to going into a war with Iran. If that situation, that scenario arises again, we've got to turn the whole system around. And we've got to claim back what is rightfully ours, which is a, a society that has got the energy and the time for each other. <laughs> Has anyone had a knife? They say they've only come here because of a knife. Get the fuck! I don't want you to I appreciate that, but can you just come over there for an hour? No, everybody needs to be aware of what's happening in this world. So many people haven't got home. They're just going to be left in the street. You have to try peace. Peaceful, peacefully, peaceful, guys. Nothing but love for everyone. Unconditional love for all. It is the duty of every person who wishes to lead a moral life to withdraw your support for immoral behaviour and activities. Make sure to be on the pavement. We need them off the pavement. Off the pavement. Off the pavement. Not on the road. Okay, of course. No, you're just going here. Yeah. That's it. Gently. It's quite hairy. We saw. We, we saw suddenly you sort of like fell out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, mate. That's all right. Can we just trim that down a bit? Do you think that that, that your message has been heard by the government? I, mean, I think clearly it has, because at the moment what we see is the government resorting to the age-old use of force. What's happening in the democracy village is just a microcosm of the philosophy which the government uses to try and solve problems. And what we must do is, is go beyond force and develop new ways of effecting change. Carefully, carefully. Are they, who are they bringing over now? Is that John? I'm okay. Yeah. Camera roll, camera roll. Careful, careful, careful. Look good. Come on, John. So our story comes to an end, and over the year and three months spent shooting this film, I was struck by how committed people were, trying to create an alternative to our current system, and how many people had been left on the outside of it. I felt like I'd become part of a minority group, who 
see an alternative way of life, but had absolutely no way of implementing it, without access to land or resources. I learned that big ideas sometimes get bogged down in very human problems. And I began to wonder how people managed to find the energy to struggle for social change, even when the outcomes are often the same. You still have to try and do things, even if they're difficult. What we need is we need a change that will allow people to use this used land to live sustainably. Come on, you've got young people on the streets who are bored, unemployed, frustrated. Let's channel that energy into something really positive. Let's, let's open a network of sustainable villages across the UK on bits of MOD land. You know, let's open up bits of the forest to forest gardening. And all right, you know, we might not even get anywhere with it, but it's still worth doing it, because what's the alternative? To do nothing?